I shall hold to the cross. I shall hold to God alone. For his love has salvaged me. For his love has set me free. That whosoever believes will not perish, they shall have eternal life. I shall wait upon the Lord. I shall wait upon His word. And by his grace, I am released. By his grace, I am redeemed. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever shall have eternal life. And by his precious blood I have been set free for the glory of Jesus' name. And I surrender all now to Christ alone, in Jesus I am saved. By his precious blood I have been set free, for the glory of Jesus' name. I surrender all now to Christ alone in Jesus I am saved for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes will not perish they shall have eternal life Your love towers over me. A gracious tempest in the sea. Your love is like a storm. Let your tide of mercy rain. Let it flood my heart again. Surround me like an ocean. Your love is crashing over me. It's surging 
like a raging sea immerse me in the wonder of your love a downpour of unending grace consuming all my reckless ways my sin submerged love is a my soul your love is like a soul surrounds me like an ocean love is crashing over me it's surging like a raging sea immerse me in the wonder of your love the downpour of an ending grace consuming all my reckless ways my sin submerge your love and save my soul your love is like a storm surrounds me like an God, help us remember that fact this morning, God, that we can't escape your love, that you've done all you need to do to prove it. You've laid down your very life. We just ask that we would be able to uh, reflect that love to each other today. We'd be able to empower and encourage each other. As saints of your church, as brothers and sisters, God, help us unite this morning, rally around your love, and just show it to uh, each other. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Take a minute and socially uh, distance your way to a greeting.
few announcements for you this morning. All right. So we, uh, let's see here. We've got a few announcements for you. This last week we started midweek Bible study. And that's going to be Wednesday, 7 o'clock here at the church. Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Um, high school and junior high youth, uh, first and third Thursdays at 6 p.m. So that is not this week, correct? Yes, not this week, next week. Um, young adults Bible studies, at Saturdays uh, for young adults. You can see Angie or Courtney for more info on that. Um, we gave this announcement last week, but just as another reminder, we're planning to do, uh, starting in November, to do Children's Sunday School. And uh, if you had any concerns or questions about that, you could see, uh, see my wife, Lauren, for uh, more info on that. And let's see here. Oh, here's, a, here's something for you. So starting in November, we're going to be going through the Book of Revelation. So that's going to be quite a treat. And so, uh, so look forward to that. And last announcement is Saturday, November 14th. Oh, my goodness. Stephanie Carroll's having a baby? <laughs> and so that's going to be uh, Saturday, November 14th, 12 p.m. Um, outside, if possible, um, in the event of rain, which we haven't had in 12 years. <laughs> they'll have to move it inside. But uh, you can see Donna for more info on that. And so uh, with that, well, just as an announcement, you know, remember that if giving, if you want to give, we're not, we're not doing the, the plate anymore, but put it in the box in the foyer marked I giving agape. It used to be agape box. I don't know what it is now. Giving box, maybe it is, but uh, tithes and offerings, tithes and offerings. So with that, let's just uh, pray for the rest of the service. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, I, I think about the, uh, the uh, admonition uh, Paul wrote that, be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, Father, and we pray for that in these times, Father, that we would shine bright for you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you can, uh, you can stand with us while we sing. And precious compassion that pours from the wounds that have won our salvation. Sin was strong, but the Savior is stronger. Come, let us worship Him. And great was the debt that we owe, and how high was the price of our healing. Paid in full by the one who is worthy. Come, let us worship him. Raised to life with Christ the Savior in his name, a new creation. Adoring Christ the Lord. In death, overcome by the word that was spoken before it was finished. Jesus saves is our song ever. Come, let us worship. 
can stand against us if God is for us who can stand against us oh, if God is for us who can stand against us If God is for us, not worry, not shame, not condemnation, who can stand against us? Oh, if God is for us, who can stand against us? Oh, if God is stronger Jesus is stronger our shame was great but Jesus you're greater sin was strong but Jesus is stronger our shame was great but Jesus you're greater sin was strong but Jesus, you're stronger. Our shame was great, but Jesus, you're greater. Sin was strong, but Jesus, you're stronger. Our shame was great, but Jesus, you're greater. If God is for us, who can stand against us? If God is for us, who can stand against us? Oh, if God is for us. can stand against us oh if God is for us the deliverer oh, who can stand against us oh if God is for us
they bow before your throne and all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing all the saints and all the saints and angels they bow before your throne and all the elders cast their crowns before the land of god and say you are worthy of it all You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. And all the saints and angels, they bow before your throne. Crowns before the Lamb of God and say, You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Singing day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. the glory he deserves the glory oh our God deserves the glory oh he is good he deserves the glory we're all singing high marvelous and how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous and how 
stand to me. Come on, sing it out, church. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and it's a miracle. Come on. Sing it. How marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. And my song shall ever be. How marvelous. And how wonderful is my Savior love for me. I don't know how, but let's raise the energy. Every verse. Come on, sing it out. He took my sin. And he took my sin and my sorrows. And he made them his very own. And he bore the burden to Calvary. And he suffered and died all alone. We're singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior in love for me. We glory his face I at last shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me all eternity we're gonna say singing how marvelous oh, how shall ever be oh how marvelous and how wonderful is my savior love for me oh is my savior love for me oh is my savior to you, Father, Father, having experienced the transformation, God, of your love in our lives, God, which makes us ever more hungry for even more, God, of what you have for us, Lord. 
Father, as we go into your word today, Father, we pray that you would just move on our hearts. Father, that you would, uh, Father, just speak clarity to the things, Father, the issues of our heart as you are so faithful to do. And God, that you would be glorified in this day, Father, throughout uh, this church assembly and all of those who are gathering under your, your lordship, God, we commit this time to you, God, in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. Please be seated and turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We're going to pick it up where we left off last week. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 11. book of Galatians we've seen is this great treatise, this um, wonderful declaration of God's love and, and God's grace and how it does transform the life uh, of the believer. And Paul continues with, with passion in verse 11. He says, see with what with what large letters I have written you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has crucified me, uh, excuse me, by whom the world has been crucified to me as I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation, a testimony of the newness of life that we have in Christ Jesus. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the God of Israel. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit. Amen. So we begin this final study in the book of Galatians by re realizing how powerfully God has used this little book. This little book combined with uh, Romans that actually has fueled the Reformation. As uh, next week we come up, uh, uh, up upon Reformation Sunday, you know, how actually this, this little book was used to... Uh, have such a ra radical impact uh, on Martin Luther. And, and from that, a great revival uh, was born, fueled by what? By the power, by the grace uh, of God in, in above, uh, among men. And so Paul begins, he says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own, ha with my own hand. And, and, and we ask ourselves, what? Why, you know, why all the sudden concern with penmanship? You know, why would Paul direct their attention, the, uh, those churches in Galatia that would be reading this uh, letter in and amongst uh, the fellowships? Why would he direct their attention to the way the letter was written? 
And the answer comes by uh, considering that um, Paul's normal mode of um, of sending letters or uh, proclaiming letters to these churches in these different localities would be to uh, dictate to a scribe or to a, a transcriber, like a secretary, would, who would do the actual writing. At the end of the letter, Paul would uh, often write a, a short um, a statement, a short salutation um, uh, at the end, uh, pretty much all saying, this salutation, I write with my own hand. And so Paul would take the uh, quill uh, from the scribe and, and uh, uh, bear his uh, characteristic uh, writing. But to this letter, the letter to the Galatians, it, it seems that it was different because evidently the whole entire letter was written by, um, by Paul's hand. And so again, why? Why would, would um, Paul draw attention to this? And I believe it's to communicate two things. First, it's to communicate the authenticity of this letter. In uh, Second Thessalonians, we catch wind that there were those who were um, uh, counterfeiting the letters uh, of, of Paul to the different churches, um, uh, specifically to Thessalonica. And so Paul wanted to make sure that uh, uh, everyone knew that it was by his own hand, uh, through the superintendence of God's Holy Spirit, working through the heart of Paul, trans uh, translating uh, God's word through his hand and his pen onto that uh, paper, to that parchment, to authenticate that he indeed was the one who was writing that. But more important than that, I believe in the emphasis that, uh, uh, that Paul makes here is to personalize the importance of, uh, of what this letter had to say, to personalize the uh, preeminence uh, of this message in and in amongst the church because there were those we, who we saw throughout this study, these uh, uh, Judaizers that were uh, coming in and trying to rob the church of the grace that, that Christ Jesus brought to us on the cross of Calvary. The, the precious sons and daughters of the most high God were being railed against by, um, by these grace robbers. Paul, um, some other scholars believe that, uh, that all of this was evidence of Paul's thorn in the flesh, you know, that uh, there was nothing more than an eye disease. In uh, chapter three, we, uh, or excuse me, chapter four, uh, Paul said to the church in Galatia that you would have plucked out your own eyes if you could, um, uh, for my sake. And so evidently there was some kind of disease of the eye, uh, the thorn in the flesh that Paul makes mention of uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 that would uh, have caused Paul to write in, in large letters. Um, uh, others uh, believe that uh, this was a, um, uh, a scholarly script in the uh, Kone uh, Greek, um, it was a cursive form of writing, but in, in, in the uh, schools of scholarship, they would teach those uh, students to write in this special script. And certainly Paul could be considered a scholar having been um, schooled in the uh, school of G Gamaliel, one of the uh, most prestigious um, our rabbis in that day and time. But in any event, having written this letter personally, having, having written this letter with his own hand, this all communicates, what? It communicates that this letter represents a personal, passionate plea, authenticating his handwriting, yes, uh, uh, but essentially to warn, again, the, the Galatians uh, of those motives, um, of those who would come in and subvert the simple gospel of grace that uh, they were teaching that those in, in Galatia, yeah, Christ, okay. Yeah, the cross, 
Um, yes, Jesus as the Messiah, they would acknowledge that, but you need to add to that. That, that. that is not sufficient. You need to add to that the dietary laws and the festivals and, and special convocations, the rites and the rituals of Judaism in order to have right standing before God. And Paul says in verse 12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these, these are they, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Paul is uh, exhorting the church to what? He's exhorting the church to exercise discernment. Paul is essentially saying here, beware. Beware of the spirit within a man um, who would focus in, in, in the outward appearance of things, who would focus in the outward appearance rather than, than, than the heart. This was a spirit that was being unleashed you know, in the region of, of Galatia with these Judaizers, with these legalists, they desired, Paul says, to make a good showing. It was all about showing, right? It was about what they were, were projecting. Good showing in the flesh. They want to look good. They, they, they want to be accepted. They want to look good to those who are around them without concern for what? For the inward move of God within the heart, without concern for the heart. This is exactly what Jesus would put the Pharisees on Front Street uh, about in Matthew chapter 23, where he says, woe to you scribes, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you hypocrites, you are ju just like whitewash tombs. In other words, what they were projecting out, outwardly didn't match the reality of what was going on inside. Focusing on the outside makes you what? It makes you conform. It makes you want to conform because, hey, we all want to be accepted, right? We all want, want to be like, but the Lord calls us to something past conformity, doesn't he? He says, be not conformed, but be what? Transformed. Transformed how? By the renewing of your mind, by the re renewing of your heart, by the work of God's Holy Spirit from with within. But these were conforming to the pressures, in this case, from the powers um, that were seen. Well, <laughs> let me ask, what was the line of demarcation you know, that, that were uh, given here? What was the line of demarcation? As, as we read, it was and still is and has everything to do with the cross, with the cross of Calvary, the sufficiency of what Jesus accomplished on the cross of Calvary, the um, efficacy and, and really the victory that we have through what Jesus accomplished, right? And, it, and it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, in verse 12, the very same ones, the very same ones who are advocating circumcision, <laughs> who are advocating, you know, the observance of this uh, Jewish rite, this Jewish ritual, they were the very same ones that were doing it to avoid what? To avoid persecution for the sake uh, of the cross. And this is telling us what? This is telling us that these are those who had in some way identified themselves with the cross. They had identified at one point in time themselves with what Jesus had accomplished on the cross, but yet what? They were unwilling to stand for what Jesus accomplished on the cross, right? They are unwilling to stand for the cross. You know, it's uh, something that I believe is um, endemic <laughs> to the spirit of the age. You know, as um, we consider 
the last days and what uh, the uh, signs that the Lord would have us um, have us take count of as we consider where we are in God's redemptive history. You know, it's it's it's, but yet it didn't hasn't started here as of late. It's been a spirit that's been around through the ages. We see it in the Apostle Peter. You know, the Peter syndrome, right? When the soldiers arrested Jesus on the night of his uh, crucifixion, they brought him to the house of the high priest. We're told, in the Gospel of Mark, we're told that Peter followed at a distance. That Peter followed at a distance. At that time, Peter was a distant disciple. He followed far enough, far enough behind so that he could hide from the fact that he was a disciple, a disciple of Jesus. He was following Jesus, but he didn't want anyone to know it, right? You know, I think it describes many followers uh, uh, of Jesus today and, and can be of us as well. You know, after Jesus' arrest, Peter thought, you know, I'll just shadow Jesus. You know, I'm going to play it safe. I'm just going to shadow Jesus. You know, I'm going to follow him, but I don't want to look like I'm following him, right? I, I just want to strike a healthy balance be to, between fanaticism and, and um, indifference. <laughs> but you know what? It was a balance that he couldn't maintain. And it was tiresome, just like it is today. I think the hardest thing to do is to live like this. You know, if you're living for Jesus, when you're, if you're sold out for Jesus, you're just responding. You're just responding to the move of God's spirit. You're using discernment. Yeah, you're speaking truth in love. Yes, but yet you're following closely. You're not following. You're not a distant disciple. You know, this, again, was a balance that, that just brought Peter to the brink. It was a balance he couldn't maintain. We discover, again, that it's just a lot easier just to walk with Jesus And so the question for us this morning is what? The question, are we shadowing Jesus? Are we shadowing Jesus? You know, with a faith that compels us to follow, and and yet with a fear that, that compels us because of fear of those around us, because of fear of not being accepted, that fear would keep us at a distance. It's apparently what the Judaizers were trying to do. They're trying to have it both ways. You know, they were trying to embrace Jesus as a Messiah, the Messiah King, right? But at the same time, they were embracing all the things that the world was embracing so that, as Paul said, that they would be accepted. And as Peter discovered, it's not only emotionally exhausting, but in the end, in the end, it's impossible. Paul continues in verse 13. He says, for not even those who are circumcised, not even these proponents of circumcision, Paul says, not even they keep the law, They're not observing the tenets of the law, yet compelling others to do so. But they desire, their desire is what? To have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. You know, what's happening here is that they they were apparently um, answering to some leadership, some uh, Judaizing leadership in... in, um, in Jerusalem, and, and, and so they were reporting back that, you know, hey, we, uh, we are having success here. We're having people, you know, um, we're siphoning off the church, um, having people, you know, conform to, to these uh, 
these Jewish rites and rituals. So what is Paul's point here? <laughs> is it circumcision? You know, is the question whether or not to circumcise, is that the issue? And really, it's not. It, it, it's not the central issue. Circumcision in and of itself was nothing more than a mechanical removal of, uh, of, uh, of flesh. And that's the way, you know, the, 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 that's the way we answer the critics who say, how is it that in Galatians 2, you know, Paul tells us in Galatians 6 here, that Paul tells us that circumcision is of no value, but in Acts chapter 16, Paul actually, actually goes and circumcises Timothy, his son in the faith. What was that all about? Well, this is understood by considering the reason that Paul encouraged Timothy to be circumcised. And what was that reason? It was so that Timothy, as he's ministering in and amongst the Jews, that his choice to not conform would be, uh, uh, would be used against him. You know, and, and so th- um, Paul here, you know, urged Timothy, and Timothy agreed that for the sake of reaching the Jews in that region, it would be best that Timothy be circumcised so that they would receive his teaching. But the central issue, again, was never circumcision because circumcision is of no external value. It guarantees nothing. (laughs) Despite what the Jews in that region were saying, it was and is not combined with all works. It's not of any value. It's, it's a work of the flesh. And so Paul's point here is what? Paul's point here is bottom line, they were too busy seeking their own glory. They were too bu- busy seeking their own self-promotion and their self um, and their acceptance by others to glorify in Christ Jesus, they were glorifying in, uh, other things, Jesus being the central issue. And how did they uh, deal with Jesus? Well, their dealing with Jesus will tell you a lot. It'll, t- it'll tell you from what spirit, you know, one speaks from the spirit of Christ or for the sp- uh, from the spirit that opposes what Christ accomplished. Paul says, But God forbid, verse 14, that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. (laughs) Paul is essentially saying here, while others may glory in other things, you know, in their diversified stock portfolios or their powers, their positions of of influence, education, something that commonly people glory in, you know, or the great sacrifices that they have made, even for the sake of, of the Lord. Paul says, but there's only one thing, one single thing that that we as Christians should glory in. And that is what? And that's what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross cross of Calvary because Jesus and the cross is the main thing and the source of everything that pertains to life and godliness and victorious living on this side of eternity and into eternity future as well. Others say the power of Christian living comes from the spoken word, right? Others through the observance, you know, on the legalistic side of doing this and that, r- religious rites and rituals, you got to do this and that. Others, you know, in the new age um, uh, mindset will tell you it's self-actualization, self-actual- right? You know, they'll say all you need to discover is the power within yourself, Right? But Paul says, no, (laughs) nonsense. What you really need to do, what you really need to do is come to grips with what Christ has already done. That's where the real power is. Because the real power and 
the real power is in the cross. You know, the real power came at the cross and what followed the cross when Jesus blew the doors of the power of sin and the power of death. It's, it's a power that rolled away, you know, that stone that uh, uh, Jesus, it's a power of the, the resurrection and it's a power. It's a power. And I'll say again, it's a power available to us in today, in this day, and in this age. It's a power that the Lord would have us avail ourselves. It's a power to be had. Paul says in verse 14, it's a power by which the world was crucified to me. Paul's world. What world was Paul's world? What world was crucified to Paul? Well, Paul's world is described in, in Philippians chapter 3 where he says, you know, I was circumcised on the eighth day, right, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of ben Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law. I was in the know. I was a Pharisee. I was a part of the elite concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law. Paul says, I was considered blameless. Paul says, it was that world that was crucified to me and I to that world. What world has been crucified to us as we make application? Uh, meaning, you know, the world and everything that it has to offer, what value is, is it? You know, uh, it was of no value to Paul. He looked on it as if the world was on the cross. The, and the world looked to Paul as if Paul were on the cross. And that's what he says essentially in Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. You know, just, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me in the life. I now live in the flesh. I live by faith through the Son of God who loves me and who's given himself for me. And that's how Paul can say in verse 15, for in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but what? But a new creation. Christ died, you guys, so that we might live as a new creation with new mercies every day, with the still small voice of God's Holy Spirit wanting to speak truth into our lives. If we would just slow down, quiet our hearts to receive. That's the new life. It's not a, a life that's dic dictated by lists. You know, some find comfort in lists. Donna finds comfort in me having a list. But lists are not where it's at. It's living by faith. It's responding to the Spirit of God as he moves and prompts to us. We become at that point, what? A new creation, a new creature, a new creation that the old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Everything in our lives become new. And we think, how does that work? Well, it's with perspective, doesn't it? It's a perspective that only Christ Jesus can bring into the life of the believer because God is a God of new things. He wants to bring newness and he wants to bring freshness. Times of refreshing into our hearts. It's like the owner, the owner that was trying to sell a warehouse property and it was run down. Windows were broken. The, it was trashed. You know, it um, for months and months lie vacant in desperate need of of repair. You know, trash all around. And as he was showing this pro property to a prospective uh, buyer, he just took pains 
their, the seller t- took pains that, oh, we, we're going to replace the, the broken glass and we're going to clean up all this mess and it's not going to be like, like you see it now. But the buyer said, you know, forget the repairs. Forget the repairs. When I buy this place, I'm going to build something brand new, something completely different. I do not want the building. What I am buying is the site. I'm buying the real estate. And that's what the Lord says to us, essentially, uh, through these words. You know, it's not what you can bring. I want your real estate. I want the real estate of your heart. I want to commune with you. I'm a God of communion. I'm a God who wants to speak truth. I want to speak love. I want to speak perspective. You know, I want to give you a perspective that you can't have apart from me. I want to do a new thing. And when this happens, Paul says in verse 16, as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the, listen to this, the Israel of God. You know, that, that had to torque the Judaizers uh, uh, of that day. And Paul speaks of this new creature, this new creation in verse 5, and then in verse 16, a new nation. A new nation, a new people. The name Israel means ruled of God ruled of God, that we're going forward under the rule of God, under the rule of what God is doing, what God sent his son to die, to bring to us. Spiritual Israel, you know, is, uh, is everywhere. It's everywhere for all that, that confess. You know, if we confess Jesus as Lord, guess what? We'll be saved. Romans chapter 10, right? And, and those are they who are citizens of the new Israel, right? And we see the importance, the importance of what? Of keeping Jesus, you know, number one in, in our lives and, and the newness that he brings in the believer's life. Uh, in verse 17, Paul says, from now on, let, from now on, let no one trouble me. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. This word mark, it marks, it comes from the Greek word uh, stigmata, you know, stigma, stigmata. And what would happen in that day and time when a servant um, was um, subject to his master, he would be uh, like branded, you know, as being owned by that master. Roman soldiers in, in uh, the Roman army, they would, uh, 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 they would demonstrate loyalty to their uh, commander by doing the same thing. They w- would be branded with the emblem of that uh, particular regiment. And in the same way, Paul says, you know, I am an example. I'm an example of what? You know, of, I'm an example of what real Christianity looks like, right? He says, look at my marks. He says, look at my body. Look at me, examine me, and tell me that following Christ, that being a disciple of Christ doesn't cost anything. Paul says, you know, I've got stars, scars, from stonings and, and beatings, you know, and, and shipwrecked and imprisonment, you know, all for the cause of Christ. And in the same way, not that we have to, but that we are willing to suffer for the cause of Christ, to stand up, to stand up and, and be counted to not being a distant disciple, but being a disciple by his side who is guided and guarded and directed by the holy presence uh, uh, of God. You know, the question is, you know, 
how much, how much has your faith cost you? How much, a question for me, has my faith cost me? You know, hopefully it's, it, it, it's cost you something. It costs you what? Sometimes it costs, costs you ungodly relationships, right? Sometimes, you know, unprofitable habits, you know, unprofitable pursuits where the Lord would stop you in your tracks and say, what's this all about? Why are you doing this? You know, how is this serving, the, you know, the, the greater good? You know, humbling yourself. It costs you humility, humbling yourself for the good of one another. What scars, what scars are we wearing? Knowing, knowing that what? Knowing that grace isn't cheap. It costs Jesus. It costs God, his only begotten son, as we just got through singing in, in, in our time of worship. Those who tell you that following Jesus you know, it's not going to cost you nothing. What have you got to lose? Well, the fact is, some difficult choices, right? Jesus says in Luke 9, if anyone desires to come after me, there's going to be some cross-bearing. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It's not a Sunday morning thing. It's a daily thing. For who, whosoever wishes to save his life, the Lord says, shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. He also says in John chapter 16, these things I have spoken to you that you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. But here's the caveat, and what a great caveat it is. But take courage, for I have overcome the world. And therein is the peace. Therein is the peace that we, as God's church, can rest in. So those who teach, those who preach otherwise aren't of the spirit of Christ, but the spirit that's opposed to Christ. And so Paul, he closes out this, this treatise, this, this great book, this book of Galatians with the following benediction. He says, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be experienced in your spirits. It's just not a one-off. It's not just a historical event. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit as an ever-abiding presence. That in times of difficulty, in times of conflict, that we can go to that place and we can meditate on the things that the Lord would bring to mind, that the Lord would uh, speak from his word, that we could be encouraged even in the face of grave difficulty because greater is he <laughs> who is in us than he who is against us, that, than he who is in the world. So Paul ends his book just like he started it, emphasizing what? Emphasizing the superiority of, of Christian living. The superior, how, you know, I, I, I consider, you know, everything that's happening around us and people are hurting and people are going through difficulty and just because we're followers of Christ doesn't mean we're exempt from some, if not all of these things. But what's the difference? It's the peace that passes, it's the grace that never ends, it's the grace that is. It's the grace that is with us. You know, Paul emphasizing the superiority of living in the life of grace. And you know, at times I can catch myself being ungracious. And it doesn't feel right. Just within my spirit, it doesn't feel right. 
and the Lord takes me back. And, and, and he takes me back through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit? And I've said it before, and I'll say it probably a hundred times more. The Holy Spirit's work is conviction. One of his works is conviction. Convi- convicting us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. That these things are real and these things are happening and these things can be a part of our lives. But it's a filter. It's a filter that the Lord uses, this filter of grace, to show us, hey, wait, you know, this isn't, this isn't gracious. This isn't loving. This isn't the course of action. What would the Lord have me do in this? How would the Lord have me respond? Lord, how would you have me respond? And the Lord says, by grace, by grace, that we are recipients of grace so that we can be conduits of grace through graciousness. <laughs> Sometimes it's, well, it's, it's against human nature, I'll tell you that. You know, it was interesting last week in the uh, hearings of Judge Comey Barrett, I don't have her name right, but the Supreme Court nomination of uh, President Trump. And there were hearings, and, you know, the, um, the opposing party was grilling. And the leader, the Senate majority leader of that hearing was our senator from California, Senator Dianne Feinstein. And, and you know, my, or the politics of uh, Fi, uh, Dianne Feinstein, or, you know, I've rarely, rarely agreed with, with her. But she showed me something that um, was remarkable. After the conclusion of the hearing, she went to the majority leader, um, Graham. Can't think of his first name, damn. Graham, um, anyway, um, she went to him and greeted him with civility, and they actually embraced. They actually embraced. After these contentious hearings, there was an embrace. I thought, that is so cool, only to learn that uh, she was grilled by uh, some elements in her party. They were calling for her ouster as... um, the chairman of this committee saying she's too old and inept and, and uh, out of touch with the politics of the day. What would they ha- have had her do? <laughs> they would have had her snub, you know, Senator Graham. But that didn't happen. There was an embrace. And, you know, it was, these things we should celebrate <laughs> in this day and time, you know, civility and, and a, a steam of of others as more important than ourselves. We don't have to agree with their politics, but it's incumbent upon us to realize as we sung in our opening, uh, one of our opening songs, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever, You know, meaning God died for this world. God so loved this entire world. God loves this world. And he loves those who are in opposition to our way of thinking. Even opposition to the cause of Christ. You know, Christ loves those those men and those women. And so we're to treat others with grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your everlasting, never-ending love. God, for the truth of your word and how it changes things. Father, how it gives us marching orders. You know, at that conflict, with that conflict, conflict at work or within the home or that disenfranchised friend, or that political opponent, you know, coming up on Thanksgiving discussions. Lord, that we would esteem you 
and in doing so, we would esteem those for whom your son died. God, give us, Father, a sense of your holy presence, God, as we march forward into the day and into the week. And if, Lord, you would tarry, Father, um, into this coming new year, Father, as we come to the close of, of this year and to the Christmas season and Thanksgiving celebration, God, that uh, we would just be attentive. Your people would be attentive to your word and to your will at every juncture. Father, because time is short and people are dying <laughs> in their sin. And Father, you would use your church as light and as salt to accomplish, Father, a harvest before, Father, you come for your church. A, uh, an occurrence that we'll be considering as we consider the book of Revelations and, and the tribulation, Father, the time of tribulation preceding that the rapture of your church, the rapture of your people, and that harvest of people in this day and age of grace, Father, that we would be your tools and that we would be your instrument, Father, to communicate the love of Christ. Father, enable us. In Jesus' name, we pray and we all said amen. God bless you guys. Um, good to be together. Love you guys and have a